just going to start by saying, I'm sorry. You know, I, this is not my law. I hate it as much as everybody else does, uh, but I'm a lawyer and I've heard all the lawyer jokes for the past 30 years. Um, but here's, here's another, I don't know if it's a joke, but it's kind of a serious thing. And that is we lawyers are kind of the devil's children. We make the most money we're, we're the most successful when things are crazy and haywire. And aside from, you know, the small business owner trying to meet payroll and customer expectations and withholding and taxes and everything else, let's throw something else into the mix that's really difficult to understand and crazy and nuts. And oh, by the way, let's throw some civil fines and potential criminal penalties on it. What a great idea. I'm don't shoot the messenger. I'm in this with you. Although, I do kind of benefit. I'm, I'm going to admit it. And I apologize ahead of time. But my goal here isn't to try and benefit from this as much as just educate everybody. With that said, um, let me click on my screen so it actually advances when I want it to. I'm not going to make you suffer through this whole presentation to understand everything. I'm going to give you everything you need to know on the first slide. Then I'm going to jump into what's the, really the most important question today for most businesses, and that is, um, are you a reporting company? And two, if you are, who the beneficial owners are. And that's what's going to get a lot of people in trouble. For example, um, by the way, I love Q&A. Hit me up. I will try and answer on the fly, especially and weave it into the presentation. Uh, I have somebody from a and T services asking why the website for this new law does not have a .gov on it. I don't know what you mean. It does have a .gov. It's fincen.gov slash BOI. That's the primary website. I'll show you in a second. So I don't know what website you're referring to, um, but you know, type it out if you want me to, and I'll, I'll explain how it fits. Anywho, so then I'll go into further detail uh, about like how to submit an initial report, how to what the issues are with updating, and then some history, how we got here. Now, um, I'm doing a lot of apologies here. And here's another one. Uh, my presentation is longer than the 50 minutes we have. And I kind of did that on purpose, just because some people don't care about the history. They just want to know what the issues are. And I'm going to tell you that up front. And then if you want to leave, leave. But we'll give you a copy of the presentation so if you do want to see more about what we had to say about certain issues, you'll have access to it. So don't take notes, just ask for the presentation and we'll give it to you. Uh, so sit back and enjoy the ride. So with that said, let's talk about the one slide. Let's just, here's what you need to know. The first issue is, is all registered companies in the United States must file beneficial ownership information um, which is called a report. So Beneficial Ownership Information Report, or BOIR for short. And here are the deadlines. Uh, if you haven't heard of them before, uh, or if you have, here's what they are. First is if the company has been formed prior to this last New Year's, January 1st, 2024. The deadline is the next January 1st, 2025 to uh, file your initial BOIR, your initial BOI report. Um, do not wait until December 31st or January 1st to do this. It's uh, We're expecting their website to be overloaded. Uh, there's going to be a lot of questions. Don't wait. Think about doing it maybe somewhere in the October time frame. If you're going to wait, maybe do it sooner. Um, if your company was formed after January 1st of this year, you have 90 days to file an initial report. At the... Um, deadline of next New Year's, that 90-day window shrinks down to 30 days. So every company in the United States is going to have to file this report. Here's the link, fincen.gov slash BOI. So uh, that question saying, why doesn't it have a .gov in it? I, I'm guessing maybe you're referring to other websites. There is a lot of non-legal competition out there. Lawyers and accountants are really scared about this. Um, and there's a lot of like non-lawyers saying, we'll help you with all of this. And I want to caution you about that because the legal penalties are pretty severe. And we're going to talk about that all in, in a few minutes. And it's not trivial to figure out who your beneficial owners are. Um, I have a question. If a company is terminated before 1231-2024, is a report still due? 
And that's by Claire Moore. And that is an outstanding question that we are getting a lot. And guess what? There is absolutely no definitive guidance by FinCEN or the statute on that answer. There's different lawyers that have different views on that. My view is dissolve your company, long as it was formed prior to this January 1st, 2024, meaning December 31st, 2023 or earlier, if you dissolve your company prior to the end of this year, you don't have to report. Now, with me saying that, that's my opinion, which could change if and when FinCEN or other elements in the government provide more guidance on this issue. There are other lawyers that say, no, you should still submit a report and then update the report indicating that it's dissolved. I think that's ridiculous, but that's a, I can spend the whole seminar talking about that one issue only. So the other thing I want you to know is when you submit an initial report, now you're on the hook to submit updates and you have to do that within 30 days. So once your initial report is filed, if anything changes about the company or anything changes about the beneficial owners, uh, the beneficial owner gets married, something like that, you have to update the report within 30 days. If you don't, if you miss a deadline or you submit false information, the penalties are severe. There are both criminal and civil sanctions. Criminal sanctions are imprisonment up to two years and fine up to $10,000. Civil sanction is worse, I think, in some ways because it's $500 a day. So if heaven forbid you file your report, but you don't specify a beneficial owner, and then two or three years goes by, if I'm doing the math right, 365 days times 500 times three, if it's three years, that could be a really large fine if the government wants to beat you up for some reason. So it's important to get this right, in my opinion. So who are the company's beneficial owners? Here's the answer. First is anybody who owns or controls 25% or more of the company. And that includes anybody holding options. So if you have a company where you have, um, you're, you're issuing stock options for your employees, you have to factor them in, in terms of that calculation on whether 25% ownership. It could also include a promise for, you know, maybe you're going to gift or give or sell your half of the company to your partner or to a child that might be considered a promise of future ownership, therefore needs to be viewed in terms of the calculations today on a beneficial owner. So what does that mean? Somebody who does not own the company today could still be considered a beneficial owner as far as FinCEN um, purposes here. And that's where I'm going to dive in further into the presentation and explain a little bit about that. The other issue here is substantial control over a company. Substantial control sounds like a legal term of art, doesn't it? And it is. And there's a lot of issues around that. We're going to go into detail on it. Assuming you figure all of that out, what do you need to submit? Well, you need to submit information about the company, and that's going to be the full legal name, any DBAs, where it's doing business, and the complete address in the United States, not a PO box, not a CMRA, a virtual mailbox. That won't work. It, so you're, it's going to have to be a home address or some address that you have physical control over, uh, and then a tax ID number of some sort. Um, you also have to submit information about the beneficial owners, and that includes their full legal name, their date of birth, complete current physical address, where they live, photo ID, only one of four possibilities. They have to be valid in, you know, not expired U.S. passport, state driver's license, government issued ID. So it could be a foreign passport, for example, valid, not a student ID, not a, a gun ownership card. None of that's going to work. Only these things. So where can you find more help? This is the final piece of this one particular slide. And FinCEN.gov is the de facto source of information, nowhere else. So even my law firm, you know, we're doing our best to educate everybody, but we aren't the final source of our information. It's going to be FinCEN. And they have what's called a small entity compliance guide. That's a wonderful document. It's like 60 some odd pages. I'm going to quote and steal from it 
extensively in my presentation only because I tend to be the dummy in the room and I don't remember stuff when I hear it once. I need to hear it a couple of times. I need to read it. And so what I'm hoping is by using the same information in the small entity compliance guide, you will have seen it before when you go to FinCEN and look at it again, and hopefully it'll stick and make more sense for you. The other thing is we wrote an expert system. I'm a, a software developer as well as a lawyer, and we wrote a very sophisticated program that will help answer those questions. Does your company need to report and who are its beneficial owners? It's located at the second link, boi-labs.com. Now I have some more questions here. Somebody asked, who is the beneficial owner in a joint property state? The Where the state is located is irrelevant to the analysis. We will talk further about the analysis, but I don't care if it's a community property state, which I assume is what you mean by joint property state. Uh, and if you mean something else, if you would mind being providing a little more detail, I'll try to answer that more directly. Timothy asks, is there a threshold below which a BOIR is not required, i.g. sole proprietorship, small business with less than a certain number of employees, et cetera? Uh, Timothy, the answer is no. There is, there's no small threshold. However, if it's a sole proprietorship and it's not registered in a state, and we're going to go into that in a few minutes, then it doesn't need to report. Entities that are registered at a state level are the ones that need to register and submit beneficial ownership information. So that could even mean partnerships. You could have a large partnership, and if it's not registered with a state somewhere, then it doesn't have to submit beneficial ownership information. Uh, there's another question here. A lot of our Native American businesses have PO boxes as addresses due to the lack of other address systems within their boundaries. Amen. I, I understand the problem here. As an um, Apex, we have that issue with registering them in the SAM.gov. I, I know. How, do, how will FinCEN deal with this current issue? I don't know. I, I apologize. I don't know the answer to that question. It's extremely valid and important. Uh, there are, uh, by the way, I should have mentioned we're working with a, a DC nonprofit firm to challenge this law at the Supreme Court. And we think there's a number of deficiencies, and I think that's one of them. So um, I appreciate you raising that. I'm going to take notes on this and uh, make sure that question gets submitted to FinCEN and um, I'm going to try and use it against them and see if we can get this law trimmed back a little bit. So I, I do apologize. I don't have an answer. Yeah, there's me apologizing again. I do that a lot. Sandra Taylor Sawyer says, any department of the state or only SOS that they must be registered. All businesses in New Mexico must be registered with the New Mexico Taxation and Revenue as an example. That's a great point, uh, Dr. Taylor Sawyer. And the law states registered with the uh, Secretary of State or appropriate um, agency. So I will go into that further, but I, I don't believe registering with a tax authority reaches the level required for this. Uh, somebody else asks, do you know what is the reasoning for this new law? I do, but it's much further down in the presentation and not as important as some of the information I want to get through. So let me get through it. If we can get to the end, I'll explain the rationale. Um, otherwise, get the presentation and it explains it. Uh, somebody else asks, I have a single member LLC owned by me, but my husband and I split the business revenue equally on our taxes. Uh, no, that's not the right way to do it. But um, that means we're both beneficial owners, right? M maybe, maybe not. Uh, it's not related to where the money goes. It relates to who has control or ownership. But the way you're doing that on your taxes doesn't make a lot of sense. It sounds like you're not doing it correctly. And I'm not trying to attack you. I apologize. A lot of people, you know, they go to like LegalZoom or a non-lawyer place, set up their company, and there's nobody there to tell you otherwise but I would recommend you talk to a tax professional because you're opening yourself up to potential tax problems if you get audited. So please talk to a CPA or tax professional, make sure you're doing that right. And then um, talk to a lawyer to make to answer your question about whether you have, to, whether your husband has to report. So with all of that, um, here is where the FinCEN.gov website, here's what it kind of looks like. And I'm pointing an arrow to the small entity compliance guide. That is the document that you should review if you have more questions or talk to a lawyer or somebody that has expertise in this area. Here is that BOI Labs website I mentioned. And if you go under solutions, there's the evaluation tool. It's free. 
and it's anonymous. We're not asking you who you are. We, we, we ask the name of the company and the owners just for referencing. So we can say, John Doe is a beneficial owner because of what you told us, but it's anonymous and free and it could take five minutes. It could take an hour, depending on how complicated your company is set up. As I mentioned, people don't set up their companies correctly sometimes. And so the program does its best to try and figure out how to handle issues like that. So it could take some time, but uh, that I would recommend that tool if you're interested. Let's talk about uh, how do you update your beneficial owner information and the, well, am I, how do you update? Okay, I'm sorry. One more thing I wanna talk about or recommend is talk to your business attorney about these issues. Consider a BOI compliance service that can help you keep track of deadlines and information. And then um, leverage a payroll service. If you don't already have one, they're very inexpensive and they help you in a hundred different ways, including making sure you're doing withholding properly, you know, all of that stuff. And these payroll systems, for example, Payday HC, uh, HCM, Payday HCM in New Mexico, they have reports that can generate, you know, like when there's a change, like if an employee changes their address. Um, if it's a, a, a beneficial owner type employee, you'll know, oh no, they changed their address and you got to submit an updated report. So I'd strongly recommend if you've been thinking about it, now is the time to do a payroll service. So let's talk about the first question. Is my company a reporting company? I stole this flow chart from the Small Entity Compliance Guide. That is something you're probably going to end up reviewing or your attorney is going to review. And it's this is the simple one. <laughs> it's um, it, it looks a little complicated just from here, but the quick sort of summary is, do you have a corporation, an LLC, or another entity that's formed or registered under the laws of a state, territory, or Indian jurisdiction. So this is formation registration issues, not submitting tax information, not complying with some sort of licensure with, you know, um, RLD or uh, tax and rev or, you know, um, PRC. We're talking about secretary of state here. Um, it must report in all circumstances, except here. There is a list of what they call exemptions. And these are typically larger entities. These are typically entities that are already known by the feds, except there's a couple here that you're probably going to want to know about. Um, and I, I did not circle tax exempt entity only because I don't have a lot more time here, folks. And this, this takes time just on these two, because you look at large operating company and inactive entity, and, you'd be, and you might say, oh, yeah, that's my company. I haven't used it in a while. Not so fast. There's rules around these things for all of them. But let's talk about the large operating entity. There are six factors here. And to make this presentation go fast, I've underlined and bolded if you want to just read those, that'll give you a quick summary of what defines a large entity that can be exempted from reporting. Basically, 20 or more full-time employees working in the United States with revenue, um, gross revenue net of returns and allowances in the United States of $5 million or more. So if your company is making $6 million, but half of its revenue is from overseas revenue, that half of the revenue doesn't count and you're still going to have to report. Uh, we have a couple more questions up here. I'll plan, uh, planning on a name change this year and possibly getting another office location. I assume I would update the driver's license and business items, get a new address first, and then file a BOI would make the most sense. Is that correct? Yes, I would agree. If your company was formed prior to 1-1-2024, meaning December 31st, 2023 or earlier, and you want to make some changes to it, make those changes, then submit your initial beneficial ownership information report or BOIR. That would be my recommendation. Otherwise, make, you know, if you submit the report now, that's fine, but then you, you got to submit an update within 30 days of when you make changes. And if you think about it, you change your address, you change maybe the name, do you do those simultaneously or do you stagger that? Maybe, you know, one month you do one thing and another month you do another thing and then you got to submit two updated reports. It's kind of a nightmare. Uh, we have another question here for clarity. A sole proprietor business is reportable, right? Sole proprietor, let's make sure we're using the right definition here. 
Sole proprietorship is a business that is not registered with the state. It's just you with a paper route. It, you, you, you don't have an LLC or corporation. You haven't filed anything with the Secretary of State. That entity does not need to report. However, you run a lot of problems. You have liability issues. You have tax problems. Um, not tax problems, excuse me. You could have tax advantages by forming an entity. So if you haven't done that, then no, you do not need to report beneficial ownership information. Now back to the large operating entity here. All six criteria must be met here in order for you to claim the large operating entity exemption. Similarly, with an inactive entity, you have six criteria here. And first of all, in number one makes no sense to me whatsoever, but it had to be in existence prior to January 1st, 2020, for some reason. So if it was formed in February of 2020, you're never going to be able to take advantage of the inactive entity status. And again, all six criteria must be met here. And here's what's a problem for a lot of people. And that is it can number six, it cannot hold any assets whatsoever. So it can't own any real estate. It can't be a holding company that owns another company. It can own no assets whatsoever. If it owns an asset, it cannot be an inactive entity, even if it's not generating any revenue. We have another question here. If you have a single member LLC, you're still required to submit beneficial ownership. Yes, that's right. Even though there is a single owner of their business. Correct. If you have an LLC or corporation with one owner or more, um, there could be zero owners, but let's not go into that rabbit hole. Uh, but yes, you would have to report. A bookkeeper can file the BOR, BOIR on behalf of the owners. The answer is anybody can file your report on behalf of the company. The issue is, are you reporting correctly? Have you correctly identified the beneficial owners? So as long as you feel confident, you know who your beneficial owners are, then yes, you can have anybody do it, including a secretary, a bookkeeper. You don't have to hire us expensive lawyers to do that. That is the first question. Does my company need to report? And I apologize, I didn't address other issues like nonprofits, but I wanna warn you about nonprofits um, there are requirements for nonprofits as well. And even if you're a valid 501c3, c6, whatever, you have to have had that for a certain period of time before you can claim uh, a nonprofit exemption. So make sure you know the rules. Don't make assumptions. Now, let's talk about the second question, and we're going to spend more time on this. And this is not always easy to answer. Who are the beneficial owners of my company? And to answer this question, we actually have to ask more questions. One is ownership interest. What is an ownership interest? What is control of 25% or more? And substantial control is kind of the indicator here. And what does that mean? Who exercises substantial control over the company? And there are some exceptions here that we're going to talk about. And who qualifies for such exceptions? Before we go into that, let's talk about substantial control, because I think that's a little easier than uh, ownership issues. Now, substantial control, there's four main buckets here. And I have them listed, and I stole this again right from the Small Entity Compliance Guide. So when you review that guide at FinCEN.gov, this will you will have seen this before. You have senior officers, and they are the folks with the titles, the president, the C-level officers, or anybody, forget the title, but performs a similar function. You also have folks with appointment or removal authority, people that have some sort of power or capability of removing or replacing or appointing senior officers. Then you have the really big problem, in my opinion, and that's important decision makers. This is a very gray area, very nebulous, and I think this is going to get a lot of people into trouble. It's basically any individual who directs, determines, or has substantial influence over important decisions of the companies. And they give some examples here, making decisions about the business, um, trade, uh, what they, you know, whether to buy assets or you know, sell assets on finance or structure, you know, merging um, 
uh, going into business somewhere else, uh, you know, all these important decisions, whoever can make those. So if you have a controller, for instance, that's not a C-level person, but if that controller is maybe making financial decisions on, you know, vendors to pick, they may be a beneficial owner. And then you have the big problem down here, this catch-all. And basically what they're trying to say is, is anybody who exercises control in unique and um, new ways that might be considered substantial. Um, and, you know, that's a really interesting thing. So the, the legal sort of opinion of this lawyer is, is if you're wondering, yes, right, let's, let's not play the game on whether you should report person A or a person B. If you're not sure, then report. Be, you know, expansive, even though there are some problems with that that I'll explain later, just to avoid trouble. What I think is going to happen over the next couple of years is if, if you know, somebody, us, uh, doesn't get this whole thing wiped away with the Supreme Court, hopefully, there will be other decisions. There are going to be poor saps out there who are going to get in trouble, and then we will have the benefit of those legal decisions to figure out, you know, more definition around this and then figure out whether we can exclude some people that you might have otherwise included. So substantial control has four categories, and I discussed all of those. The senior officers, folks that have appointment or removal authority, important decision makers, and the catch-all. Now, important decision makers, you really need to study this a little bit and be expansive, as I talked about or mentioned. Um, the important takeaway here is beneficial owners don't have to actually be owners in the traditional sense. You have to look at what their level of importance is to the business and what kind of decisions they're making in the business. Um, you know, there has been quite a bit going on in the chat. I apologize, and I haven't been reviewing that. Um, so if if there's something somebody wants to respond to or wants me to respond to in the chat, if you can put that in the q and I'll answer that. Otherwise, I'll just let the chat do its thing if, if that's okay with everybody. Um, so, Let's talk about ownership interests. And now I apologize again, this is gonna get a little boring and dull, but it's, it's important depending on how your organization is structured. Ownership interest can have a number of different possibilities here. Uh, the FinCEN is very expansive with their definition. And first is equity, stock, or voting rights. So if you have, for instance, two classes of ownership where you have you know, one class with voting rights and another class with no voting rights, but profit interests. Or you got people that can vote with no profit, but you got people that have the opposite. All of that is considered ownership interests as far as FinCEN is concerned. So it doesn't matter if you have, you know, some segmented group of owners that don't have a lot of control over the business. If they have an ownership interest as defined here, they could be considered beneficial owners if they cross that 25% threshold. Capital or profit interest is really just a restatement of what I just said about equity, but it applies more to like LLCs, organized or other organizations, taxes, partnerships. And what you have there is folks that might have a profit interest versus a voting interest or a capital interest, but it's the same thing as far as FinCEN is concerned. The big issue here uh, that is going to get people in trouble are the next three, and that is convertible instruments is one of them. And what is a convertible instrument? It could be a friend, a relative that loaned the company money, but in that promissory note, it gives the lender the ability to say, instead of paying me back, I, I could convert it to an ownership interest. That's a convertible interest. And if there's anything like that out there, then they could be beneficial ownership individuals as well. So that could be viewed as an ownership interest with a convertible note, even though they own nothing other than they have a document that says they could. And it's the same with uh, options and privileges. So if you have employees that have an option to potentially buy into the company, that is considered an ownership interest as well. And you have to factor that into the equation. And then finally, they have this catch-all here. And basically, I kind of joke and say it's kind of like a, a nudge, nudge, wink, wink kind of thing for people trying to avoid 
having to report their beneficial ownership information to FinCEN. So if there's somebody that says, oh, I'm not going to own it, and I got to warn you, I see a lot of fraud out there where somebody is saying, hey, I have this company, but I want you to own it. I want you to be the owner, and I'm going to pay you to do that. There's different names for it. Nominee services is a big one. Run away from that because, first of all, they're probably trying to avoid some sort of legal or criminal liability themselves by putting you as the front man. And I see time and time again, money, money laundering problems occurring with this nominee. Do not do it, or at least get a lawyer involved to review the deal. But uh, this is designed to catch those issues, that catch all. So, you know, I'm gonna restate again, the have there's five categories here, the equity stock, uh, voting rights, capital and profit interests are really a restatement of the same thing, convertible instruments, uh, options and privileges in the catch-all. So the big interesting issue here is, let's look at owners now. When in the context of those five categories, what is an owner? Well, it could be an individual, of course, or it can be a company. And that's really interesting, isn't it? Because if you have a company owning a company, how does that relate to individuals? The answer is you have to go up the stream. So if you, you have your reporting company here, which is owned by maybe one or more companies, you have to go then look at those companies and figure out who its beneficial owners are. And then those beneficial owners then relate back to the reporting company on a pro rata basis. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a couple more minutes. Now, you see why I gave you all the information on the first slide? I mean, I think we're going into a crazy rabbit hole here. And of the 55 attendees, how many of this is going to apply to you guys? So I apologize. Um, but you, you got a lot of the core information. We're going into more rabbit holes here. Um, Bear with me in about another five, 10 minutes, we'll be through that and how to deal with submitting reports. So the other possible owner of a company is going to be a trust, right? And so how does that work? And the answer is, if the, the individual is associated with the trust, depending on their power over the trust, could be inferred down to the reporting company. And we'll talk about that as well. But examples would be a trustee or other individual who has the authority to dispose of the trust assets, a beneficiary who is the sole permissible recipient of the trust income or has a right to demand a distribution or withdrawal, a grantor, settler with the right to revoke or otherwise withdraw trust assets. All those individuals could be considered beneficial owners of the reporting company based on the trust's ownership of that company. So don't assume, oh, a trust is involved, there's no beneficial owners here. That's not necessarily the case. So finally, just to make things even more interesting, um, we have what's called direct and indirect ownership. And I kind of hinted at that in the previous slide. Direct ownership is what you think it is. John Doe owns 50% of the company. At all times, direct ownership is going to be equal to 100%. So if you have a company, it's owned 100%, right? The question is, who owns that 100%? But indirect is through an intermediary, like a company or a trust. And that means you have to look at that intermediary and its beneficial owners to figure out how that relates back to the reporting company. And so there's going to be some sort of intermediate individual here that we need to figure out and expose. And what's interesting is ownership, indirect ownership can be much greater than 100%. I know it doesn't make sense mathematically, but here we are. We have another question here. If I own a stock in a company and share in the profits, am I a beneficial owner of that company? Yeah. <laughs> now, are you at the threshold needing to report? That's another question. Can't answer that, right? Without going into a lot more detail about the company. And is the company a reporting company? Public companies, most public companies are not reporting companies. So, you know, if you own some a Apple stock or FedEx or something like that, you, you don't have to worry about submitting your beneficial ownership information because you're participating in the open market. I'll give you a quick example here. A trust owns a company 50%. Person X owns the company 50%. The trustee, beneficiary, grantor, and settler are considered indirect owners of 50% of the trust. So 
in my example, you have indirect ownership of 200% of a trust that only owns the company 50%. And then you have person X owning the other 50%. So there's three different ways FinCEN defines how to calculate the threshold of ownership interest. And the first thing is, is you assume all options, privileges, convertible notes, everything have all been exercised and converted. So you look at the future ownership and you bring it to the present. Does the company issue stock or is it taxed as a C corp or an S corp? If so, then we have two different calculations to make, which is kind of confusing. And a lot of companies don't have this information. But the first is you look at the total combined voting power across all classes. Then you also look at the combined value of the ownership interests and you figure out percentages for both of those and you look at the larger number. And that is the threshold number that you use to determine who is 25% or more beneficial owner of the company or not. Does not have different voting levels or classes. It has just one level of ownership. Then you can delete the value box. We don't need to look at that. And we just focus on the power of the vote. Okay, so if you have a company with folks that can vote and folks that can't, and they can only get profits, that's two different classes. And you have to use this calculation. If you don't have that, then you can ignore the value. Now, there's another way, and that is, is if you are taxed as a partnership. If so, you look at the capital and profit interests combined and generate a percentage from that. Finally, there's a fallback. And that basically says you look at who owns 25% or more of any class. You don't combine the classes. You look at them individually. And then whoever has 25% or more in each one of the classes are those that are going to be considered beneficial owners. So let's go through some examples. Simple one. This reporting company in the top and individual A owns 100%. Well, individual A is going to have to report. Easy enough. Now, by the way, I stole these from the FinCEN, the Small Compliance Entity Guide. So I'm hoping this will be the second time you see it. Uh, when you go to the guide, and I hope that'll help you remember this. Now, the way they, the guide works is the circles represent beneficial owners who have to report. The triangles represent beneficial owners who do not need to report because they don't meet the threshold. In this example here, you have three owners plus a president who is not an owner, individual D. Individual D is a circle. He has to report. Why? Because he is substantial controller of the company based on his role as a president. Individual A owns 50% of the organization directly. That individual has um, over 25% ownership, therefore has to report. Same with individual B. It's 40%, still over 25%. Individual C, however, only owns 10%, is under the threshold. Easy peasy, right? So let's get a little more complicated. Um, this is similar for a partnership. I think it's the same as the other one, but FinCEN talks about it. I'm not going to go over it. This is the one I want to go over with real quickly. And this tends to be fairly um, common with a lot of companies. And here is the indirect ownership issue because the reporting company is not owned by individuals directly. It's owned by other companies, company Y and company Z, 50% each. So we have to look at the individuals here and what this does a great job of is look at individual A. Individual A circle has to report. Why? Several reasons. One is CFO. So they have substantial control over the company. They have to report, period. But let's pretend individual A was not a CFO. Would they have to report? I don't know. They own 30% of company Y which owns in turn 50% of the reporting company. So we look at a pro rata. What does that mean? 30% of 50% is 15%. Am I doing that math right? Of course, I'm doing it on the fly and I apologize, I can't remember, but um, yeah, 50% of 30% would be 15%. So individual A's ownership interest from company Y for the reporting company is considered 15%. But individual A also owns company Z, 25% of company Z. What is 25% of 50%? It is 12.5%. What is 15% plus 
27%, 27.5, something, it's over 25%. And so the, uh, I need a calculator for everything. And I'm a former electrical engineer. It tells you how much of an idiot I am. Anywho, we know it's over 25%. So individual A's ownership interest, you sum up across the various companies and look at what the total is. So individual A, even if he wasn't a CFO, would be considered a beneficial owner because he crosses the threshold with his net ownership interest attributable to the reporting company. Individuals D and E, they also own 25% of company Z, but they are not considered beneficial owners because their pro rata ownership interest of the reporting company is less than 25%. It's only 12.5%. So this is a great example of how things can get a little nuts. It doesn't include trusts and things like that, but we have lots of combinations and permutations. And this is the danger associated with not talking to a professional before you assume you know your beneficial owners. And I really want to encourage people to run our program. It's free and anonymous or talk to a professional, just get an opinion so that you don't get yourself in trouble down the road. So let's talk about exceptions briefly for reporting. So what I, you should have enough information now. And if you're smarter than me, most people are, you're probably going to know how to, you know, the rules of thumb for figuring out who your beneficial ownership, um, beneficial owners are. The question now is, can any of them be excluded or accepted for some reason? The answer is yes, in certain instances. One is minor children. If there's a minor children that's a beneficial owner, as legally defined in the relevant jurisdiction, and I apologize to any Navajo Nation participants, I'm not a Navajo Nation lawyer. I don't know what the Navajo Nation says as it relates to age of majority for its jurisdiction, but it matters a lot because if you have a Navajo Nation participant or member who is a beneficial owner in a company, you would apply the Navajo Nation's rules around that on whether the minor child could be excluded for reporting purposes. Not the state of New Mexico or Arizona, but the Navajo Nation itself. As the, for the relevant jurisdiction of the beneficial owner, not the company. The trick is you have to have a parent or legal guardian submit their BOI, their beneficial ownership information instead of the minor child. And it goes away when the minor child reaches the age of majority. Now you have exception number two, nominees, intermediaries, cust um, custodians and agents. And I hate that word nominee because I mentioned it earlier, it can get you in trouble if you're not careful. But at the end of the day, um, this is really meant for like tax advisors, lawyers, stuff like that, that might be making decisions on behalf of the company. But in reality, they're not making their own decisions. They are making decisions on behalf of somebody else. And that somebody else is the one that needs to report still. There are other exceptions, employee exception. Now, this is an interesting one because we have three things here. And oops, this, all three have to be true. But it, one has to be an employee of the company as defined by statute, meaning an actual W-2 employee, not a contractor. And their only substantial benefit from the company is from their employment status, not from any kind of ownership possibility like options. And then finally, they're not a senior officer. If an employee is a senior officer, they have to report. But I did mention, for example, a... Um, controller. Would a controller have to report? And the answer is, well, if they're making some decisions, but they're not a senior officer, uh, but they're only an employee, then you can probably exclude them under this exclusion. Finally, we got a couple of others. Inheritor, that makes no sense to me whatsoever. They, they might have a future ownership interest as defined in a will, but that they're excluded. Don't worry about anybody that you have mentioned in your will if that's the only place that they may take ownership. However, um, once they inherit, they become a beneficial owner, of course. There is a creditor exception. So, that, you know, a bank, a finance institution may be a VC, although, you know, if a VC is exerting control over the company, probably not. But if it's a creditor who has the ability to swoop in and take ownership interest to the company or redirect it to protect its loan, then sure enough, we can um, use that exception possibly. So what exceptions finally exist? There's another one, and that is there is an exempt entity. And what that means, it's kind of buried in the 
fine print in the, the document that I mentioned, the Small Entity Compliance Guide. It's page 39. But basically, if your company is owned by an exempt entity, like a government, let's say the city of Albuquerque has an ownership interest in your company, then you don't need to identify who the beneficial owners are of the city of Albuquerque, for example, right? Thank God. So you don't have to worry about that. So how to submit, you go to FinCEN.gov. You apply for a FinCEN ID. I recommend you have all your beneficial owners do that. Um, somebody asked, I have missed, but what's the reasoning for the law? You didn't miss it. It's a little further in the presentation. And I, we're just not going to have time for that. And I apologize, but you can request a copy of the presentation and, and get it. The quick answer is it's bipartisan. And we've had a lot of pressure from the European Union and other international organizations to do this. Um, you can, I have the links of where you need to go. I'd mentioned the information about the company you need, as well as the information of the beneficial owners. And uh, you update, I mentioned briefly, same place. You need all the information of the beneficial owners or their FinCEN ID, and then you need to do it every, within 30 days of anything happening to a beneficial owner. Somebody dies, somebody gets married, they change their name, they move their primary residence. So um, here's the history, but we really don't have time for that. I'm sorry. Um, I would just ask for a copy of the presentation, and you could read it if you, if you really care or not. Let's jump into Q&A. And you can either voice it if you want or type it in. I have two right now. Any advice for people making a trust for their adult children? How to go about making things easier? Talk to a tax, uh, a tax trust estate planning attorney. Um, every state has different rules around this. And um, now you have to think about the beneficial ownership interest and the tax implications. So talk to a professional and they can help you navigate all of that. I don't have any quick tips for you other than that. I apologize. Uh, Kristen asks, what happens if a business overreports on beneficial ownership, listing individuals who are not over the threshold or should not be on the report? There's no penalty for that, Kristen. The issue, though, is it's more people to keep track of if, you know, somebody changes their name or moves their primary residence or the ID they used expires, that would trigger an updating event. So the more people you include as beneficial owners, the more risk you have that you might miss that 30 day window to update the beneficial report. So I think there is a, um, a reasonable you know, focus to limit the number of beneficial owners on your report if you can do that. Does each beneficial owner need an uh, FinCEN ID? Angelica asks, and that's a great question. And the quick answer is no, but I would strongly recommend it. Why? If you're a business owner, you have to report the beneficial owners. And you can do that in two ways. You can give FinCEN the FinCEN ID of a beneficial owner, or you got to give them all the information, the, the, the legal name and a copy, a, a photo of the photo ID. You got to do all of that, which means you got to maintain all of that and update all of that. If you just get the FinCEN ID, you're really leaving it to the beneficial owner to keep that information up to date. And you're just reporting the FinCEN ID. So I think from a management and administrative standpoint, it'd be much easier for you to deal with the FinCEN IDs. Uh, Steve asks, generally speaking, is a 501c3 exempt? I can't tell you generally. You got to look at the rules. And the quick answer is yes, if. And it's the ifs you need to look at. Specifically, there's a, and I don't remember them off the top of my head. I apologize. But I want to say there's three criteria. One of them is it's a, you know, validly registered with the IRS. That would be the 501c3. But the other issue is that it, has maintained that status for a period of time in the past. I want to say it's 12 months, but I could be wrong about that. It could be a little bit more or less. So look at the rules and make sure your nonprofit complies. And if it does, then it could be an excluded entity and not have to report at all. Uh, somebody else asks, if a new business is formed with one owner, but has silent partners, would the silent partners be listed as beneficial owners? You know, great question. And it, it begs the question, though, what is a silent partner? Well, do they have an ownership interest or not? Do they have any kind of control over the organization or not? Those are the questions you have to ask. And if the answer is yes to those questions, then yes, you need to report them. You may say, I see this all the time, by the way, where people are like, well, I got a silent partner. Well, are they owner of your company or not? Well, you know, they don't, they're not on the docks. Well, what are they? Is it is it a nudge, you know, nudge, nudge, wink, wink kind of deal? 
Well, that's in the catch-all. And so, yeah, you probably still need to report them. And you should never have that anyway, because you're always creating a possible circumstance for problems. And remember what I said about us lawyers, we're the devil's children. We make the most money when things are the craziest. So don't do that because you're opening up an opportunity for me or another lawyer to make a lot of money on a debate or dispute with yourself or your partners. And I can blather on about that. I apologize. So the quick answer is there was a lot of uh, push with uh, what's called the Financial Action Task Force. This is an international organization trying to get the U.S. to collect more information about beneficial owners. Basically, uh, what they're trying to do is deal with anonymous shell companies, which is ridiculous to me because these guys are going to lie about stuff anyway. So they're just putting more burdens on, on the legitimate businesses, in my opinion, but they're trying to crack down on money laundering, terrorists, and criminals. And so they want to be able to have a single database where they can trace and track everything. Now, this has been going on since 2006. And we've tried to push different stuff back in 2018, 2016. The different acts were pushed out and just they've gone nowhere, but they've always been bipartisan. So somewhere in the you know 2016 to 2018 uh, range, they started coalescing around uh, FinCEN with the Bank Secrecy Act and getting more information. And they actually started targeting certain cities, not Albuquerque or anywhere in New Mexico, but they were doing Southern Florida, New York City, Chicago, Seattle, so on. And they were getting more information on bank loans, uh, I'm sorry, with title insurance, even if a bank wasn't involved. So in 2019, uh, we did get the CTA Act of 2019 out, and it did create a centralized database, they changed some tweaks and laws with what was being discussed in the past. And we ultimately had a bipartisan support for two acts here. One is the Corporate Transparency Act, which is what you hear of, and a counter act of 2019. And the CTA is kind of the what, what are we doing here? And the CA is the how, which basically gives FinCEN the power to do what it's doing. So at the end of the day, the quick answer is, it's bipartisan. Um, we actually, Trump approved and signed into law some of this in his administration. The Biden administration continued it and then is doing the enforcement. And that's kind of how we got here. I wish everybody the best and success. I know it's hard to run a profitable business and meet payroll, and um, but you have a lot of great resources in the state of New Mexico. And if you're not sure who to reach out to, reach out to me and I'll direct you as appropriate.